Good morning, folks. Psalm 73, 26 says, My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. So let's join our hearts together and let's worship our holy and holy God. And we just invite you to remain seated during this first song so people can find their seats. But let's join our hearts together. Holy, holy, holy. gathered in this assembly of, of Safe Harbor Baptist Fellowship, and it's great to be here worshiping our Lord together. Uh, make sure you take note of your bulletin. We have quite a few announcements uh, and things going on this time of year with the holidays. Uh, a couple things of note. Uh, next Saturday is our work day here at Safe Harbor, so 
next Saturday morning, we'll meet here uh, starting at 8 a.m. and do some work on the outside and around the inside of the building just to, to get ready for the, uh, the, the winter and the holiday season. Also, uh, one of the big th- outreaches we do here at Safe Harbor is called Share the Joy. And each Christmas time, we try to adopt some families in this neighborhood um, and purchase gifts and provide food and uh, have a time where we get together with them as a way to meet those families and to connect with them, uh, to minister to them, to, to help share the joy of Christmas, but also uh, with the hope of sharing the good news of Jesus and introducing them to Jesus as we get to know them. And so uh, you have an opportunity to participate this year again with Share the Joy. We have a sign-up sheet that you can sign up to uh, bring or donate food. That's already out there. Next Sunday we'll have a, a table set up where you can pick a, a label off and purchase gifts for an individual. And so just make sure when you do that you sign your name and what you picked. Uh, if you have any questions about that, you can see Catherine Lester, and she'd be happy to answer any questions, or she's kind of heading up uh, that team this this year. And so uh, please consider uh, using your time and your resources to, to help reach out to our community and share the love of Christ. I also want to mention we, uh, we have the elder team, John, Chad, and I have two nominations uh, that we would like for you all to consider, uh, Danny Bowen and Simon Schulte, uh, to become elders here at Safe Harbor. And so we will be voting as a church on December 4th. Uh, that's our next church family meeting that evening. And uh, so if you have any questions in the meantime, you can come see me or one of the other elders or see uh, Danny and Simon, and, and uh, we'd be happy to walk you through the process and kind of what has led us up to this, this point. Uh, but please prayerfully consider them as candidates to become elders uh, starting in, or uh, and we'll vote in December. Uh, also, if you'd like to give uh, online to the work in the ministry of this church, uh, or you, if you'd like to give, you can give online or you can drop it in the offering box on the wall as a way on the way out. So let's continue uh, worshiping through God's word and prayer and song. For our call to worship this morning, we're going to be reading out of Romans chapter 5, verses 20 and 21. Would you stand for the reading of God's word? It says, The law came along to multiply the trespass. But where sin multiplied, grace multiplied even more, so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace will reign through righteousness, resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, humbly bowing before you, a holy God. And we are sinful people. And we can only come because of the precious blood of Jesus Christ that makes us eligible to come boldly before your throne of grace and to find mercy and help in our time of need. Lord, we want to offer up our praise to you this morning, for you are truly, truly worthy of our praise. I pray that our hearts and minds during this service will be stayed on you, that we would shut out all uh, disturbances and interference. And Lord, may we hear from you this morning because we are a people who desperately need to hear from you. We love you and we praise you and we give this prayer to you in the (coughs) precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's continue to worship through song. Yeah, 
our every prayer with sovereign power and tender care. All praise to Him whose love is seen in Christ the Son. God within our hearts, the spirit of all truth and peace, the fount of joy and holiness. To Father, Son, and Spirit now, our souls we lend, our wills we bow, to you the triune God we raise, with loving our song of praise to Father, Son, and Spirit now. Our souls we lift, our wills we bow to you, the triune God we raise with loving hearts. Our song of praise
celebrate Him, church. Just the voices. God, you reign. God, you reign. Forever and ever. God, you chorus of voices. All right, please uh, grab your Bible or your app, and uh, let, we'll be reading from Titus chapter 3, verses 3 through 7. It's Titus chapter 3, 3 through 7. For we too were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by various passions and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, detesting one another. But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy, through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. He poured out his Spirit on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we may become heirs with the hope of eternal life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for this day, for the ability to gather together here in your house with your people to worship you. Thank you for loving us, Lord. Thank you for calling us out of foolishness, out of disobedience, out of our own deceitful and wicked ways calling us to you. Lord, we thank you for freeing us from the shackles and chains of our own sin, for calling us out of darkness and into your glorious light. Lord, forgive us for continuing to return to that sin and not live in your power and grace. You've given us such beautiful freedom from sin and to die to that old self, freedom that only you can provide and that you freely give to us. There's nothing we could possibly do to ever earn it. It's a gift through faith, not of our own works. Father, we thank you for loving us and convicting us to not allow us to stay separated from you. Lord, in the battles and trials, we so often lose sight of your eternal purposes. Forgive us, Lord, for our prideful hearts that forget who is the king of kings and rules over our life. Forgive us for knocking you off the throne of our lives and our failed attempts at living life in our own power. May we seek you first in your righteousness, Lord. May we not only seek you, but live in your beautiful glory and grace every hour, 
of every day. Lord, fill our cup that it overflows, and thank you for your mercy and grace to live through your mighty, death-defeating power. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. the name remains 
Scripture reading for today is from Genesis 38, so you can turn your Bibles there. And uh, the, the uh, reading is a little sensitive in nature, so we're going to go ahead and uh, kids can make their way downstairs to their classes as we are turning our Bibles to Genesis 38. And you can follow your teachers at out the back door there. So Genesis chapter 38, we're continuing our sermon series in the book of Genesis. And God's word says this. At that time, Judah left his brothers and settled near an Adulamite named Terah. There Judah saw the daughter of a Canaanite named Shua. He took her as a wife and slept with her. She conceived and gave birth to a son and named him Ur. She conceived again, gave birth to a son, and named him Onan. She gave birth to another son and named him Shelah. It was at Chezeb that she gave birth to him. Judah gave a, got a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. Now Ur's, Ur, Judah's firstborn, was evil in the Lord's sight, and the Lord put him to death. Then Judah said to Onan, sleep with your brother's wife, perform your duty as her brother-in-law, and produce offspring for your brother. But Onan knew that the offspring would not be his. So whenever he slept with his brother's wife, he released his semen on the ground so that he would not produce offspring for his brother. What he did was evil in the Lord's sight, so he put him to death also. Then Judah said to his daughter-in-law, Tamar, remain a widow in your father's house until my, my son Shelah grows up. For he thought he might die too, like his brothers. So Tamar went to live in her father's house. After a long time, Judah's wife, the daughter of Shua, died. And when Judah had finished mourning, he and his friend Hirah, the Adulamite, went up to Timnah to his sheep shearers. Tamar was told, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep. So she took off her widow's clothes veiled her face, covered herself, and sat at the entrance of Enaim, which is on the way to Timnah. For she saw that though Shelah had grown up, she had not been given to him as a wife. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. And he went over to her and said, Come, let me sleep with you, for he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. She said, What will you give me for sleeping with me? I will send you a young goat from my flock, he replied. But she said, only if you leave something with me until you send it. What should I give you, he asked. And she answered, your signet ring, your cord, and the staff in your hand. So he gave them to her and slept with her, and she became pregnant by him. She got up and left, then removed her veil and put her widow's clothes back on. When Judah sent the young goat by his friend, the Adulamite, in order to get back the items he had left with the woman, he could not find her. He asked the men of the place, where is the cult prostitute who was beside the road at Enaim? There's been no cult prostitute here, they answered. So the Adulamite returned to Judah saying, I couldn't find her. And besides, the men of the place said, there has been no cult prostitute here. Judah replied, let her keep the items for herself. Otherwise, we will become a laughingstock. After all, I did, not, I did send this young goat, but you couldn't find her. About three months later, Judah was told, Your daughter-in-law, Tamar, has been acting like a prostitute, and now she is pregnant. Bring her out, Judah said, and let her be burned to death. As she was being brought out, she sent her father-in-law this message. I am pregnant by the man to whom these items belong. And she added, Examine them. Whose signet ring, cord, and staff are these? Judah recognized them and said, She is more in the right than I since I did not give her to my son, Shelah. 
and he did not know her intimately again. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twins in her womb. As she was giving birth, one of them put out his hand, and the midwife took it and tied a scarlet thread around it, announcing, this one came out first. But then he pulled his hand back. Out came his brother, and she said, what a breakout you have made for yourself. So he was named Perez. And then his brother, who had the scarlet thread tied to his hand, came out and was named Zerah. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you as your people, worshiping you, the God who is over all things, the God who is faithful to keep promises in spite of our sin, even in the midst of our sin. You are faithful, and you are able to redeem and bring good when we don't see how it's possible. So, Father, we praise you as we come now to your word and ask, Lord, that you would teach us through your word, knowing that all scripture is profitable and useful for building up as we seek to serve you and grow in you. Lord, we pray for this assembly, that our hearts would be ready to receive whatever it is that you would have to speak to us today. Lord, we, we thank you for the many people who are gathered around the world, Christians around the world worshiping you, some in hidden places, some in very prominent places, but all with hearts that love Jesus Christ and want to serve him. Our hearts this morning think of the Turpin family and Willowbrook Church in Staten Island, New York, who we partner with and how they are seeking to spread the good news, the fame of Jesus across the city of New York. We ask that you would continue to bless them as they do that, as they've seen people come to to know Jesus and whose lives have been changed by the gospel. And we ask that you would continue to bless that congregation as they serve uh, that city and minister the good news. We pray for Cedar Grove Baptist here in Scott County and Stamping Ground as they continue to search uh, for a new pastor. And we pray that you would guide that church to the the man that you would have to lead that body of believers and that you would bless them in the process and and that you would provide a person who would continue to speak the the truth of of the gospel to that church and to the community around them. Lord, we thank you for this church and the fellowship that we share around the cross and for the time that we were able to share last night through the the chili cook-off and the fellowship we share as we were able to just minister to one another, encourage one another, all rooted in the truth of who you are. And I pray that that would be the case today as we are gathered in this place. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You all may be seated. And let me just say, we are going to be taking the Lord's Supper together at the end of the service. So if you haven't already picked up uh, the elements, you can uh, do that uh, before we take that, that together. So we, re- we just read Genesis 38, and when we read a passage like that, sometimes our first reaction is just, sometimes the Bible is shocking, isn't it? That passage we just read at first reading is shocking, sad, disturbing. I, I just run out of analogies to try to think about th- this passage. But in reality, isn't life that way? Life can, can take some shocking twists and turns, and this just reinforces the key truth that the Bible is God's truth for real life, not some imaginary life that we pretend everything is good, but the Bible is God's truth for real life for real people in a real world that is fallen and searching for meaning and hope and understanding. And I've been surprised, honestly, as I've been studying this passage this week and have been looking at, um, you know, different sermon series and sermons that other pastors have preached, how many pastors actually just skip over this whole chapter. And I'll be honest, that it would be easy to do that. It's uncomfortable to read and to talk about. But they seem to avoid it. And I, I think this sends a message that isn't true. Because we believe we are gathered here in this place around God's word because we believe every word of this is from him and is profitable for us. And so if God says, hey, I'm going to record this and you need to hear this, then we, we better believe we need to hear this. God has something for us to teach us. 
And so what is the brokenness of this family? What we just read, the brokenness of Judah and Tamar and this entire family have to teach us about God. What does he want us to know? And I think it's this. When our sin is exposed, God calls us to trust in his unfailing plan. Let's be honest. There's a lot of sin in that passage. There's a lot of sin, a lot of problems. But God and his bigger plan overcame it all. You know, the last couple of weeks, we have been looking at the life of Joseph, the last section of the book of Genesis. And Joseph really is going to be the, the central uh, character uh, in the rest of our sermon series as we finish out the book of Genesis for most of the, most of the rest of the book. But ultimately, the, the point of these chapters is not Joseph. The point o- over all this is that God's providence is what is central, not a man, not a fallen man named Joseph. It's God who is over all men and his providence directing through it all. You know, God providentially rules over all things and he fulfills his purposes and his promises to his people in his perfect way. And we left off last week with Joseph being sold into slavery by his own brothers. He's been taken off into Egypt. But today, it's almost like we, we leave Joseph over there for a minute, and we go look at another member of his family, his brother Judah. And at first, we read, we're reading through the book of Genesis, and you may be like, wait a minute, what, what just happened to Joseph? Right? We, we're reading this, this crazy story about Joseph, and now all of a sudden he's not even in this whole chapter. And it could appear like this is totally unrelated. But in reality, it's all a part of God working his bigger plan and bringing two brothers who are in two very different places into, into view for his purposes. And so when we read this and we think, well, did God, did you mean to do this and take uh, our attention off Joseph? That, that first impression is wrong. And so in this passage, we, we see really three the first three main points are, are helping us see uh, this man and his sin and the consequences of that sin. But then the story ends with a reminder that in spite of all this brokenness, all this sin, God is still redeeming it and working out his bigger purpose. And this gives us hope today. So the first thing we see in this passage is sin has consequences. God just wants us to, to be reminded of that. So the camera... Uh, zooms over from Joseph over to Judah. And we already knew from last week that this family has some serious issues. All right, This this family has sin that is everywhere. There's jealousy going on because uh, all these brothers uh, see that their father loves one of their brothers, Joseph, more than them. And so what do they do? They, They take it on themselves. First, they were planning on killing him. They end up selling him into slavery and then pretending that he's died and lying to their father about it. And so we just see sin piled on on top of sin. And then as we see them disobeying and disregarding God, we see the effects of that uh, in this man Judah and his family. And so in verses 1 through 6 of of chapter 38 here, we see that Judah kind of leaves the rest of his family behind and goes off to a different place. Meanwhile, his brother's in Egypt. So Judah goes off, and he decides to start his own family. Right? The problem is he goes to a place where people aren't worshiping God. The, it's the place of the Canaanites, where they're actually worshiping false gods who, who are like a cult and have prostitutes as a part of that worship. And so uh, he, he marries this Canaanite woman, and uh, then the, his, her name is Shua, and then they have three sons. The oldest is Ur, the next is Onan, the third is Shelah. And we come to verse 7, it says this. Now Ur, Judah's firstborn, was evil in the Lord's sight, and the Lord put him to death. Now it's pretty clear, Ur has some pretty serious sin here, right? Because there are consequences before God. The God who holds all power, uh, all sovereignty over life and death. God creates all life, but God also has the right and the power to take life. And that's what he does. That the consequence of Ur's sin is that he loses his life because God is just. It was a very common practice in that culture 
almost, uh, it was accepted and expected that if uh, your brother dies, then you would take your brother's wife and try to produce an offspring that would then continue your brother's line. You would, you would take the, the, the widow as your own and continue his line on his behalf. Now, why would people do that? That, that seems like a really weird, and let's be honest, a sinful thing to us. But ultimately, it was meant to be to help the deceased brother's family, to, to provide an heir that would be able to provide for that family so their line would continue. In, Deuter- in Deuteronomy 25, God actually makes this part of his law for Israel that they would be faithful to do this for their family members. And so Judah then, in light of that, goes to his second son and sends his second son, Onan, to fulfill duties to his, his dead brother's wife so that they may continue their line. And verse 8 says, Then Judah said to Onan, Perform your duty as your, as your brother-in-law and produce offspring for your brother. But Onan knew that the offspring would not be his so whenever he slept with his brother's wife, he, he did it in a way that she couldn't get pregnant. So Onan, what we see here is a man who's very selfish. A man who refused to provide for his brother and his, and his family. But also, he's taking advantage of this woman. And using her for his own pleasure, but not providing for her. This is essentially abuse. He's not sacrificing. He's not loving her. This is a sinful man. And this sin also has serious consequences. Verse 10, what he did was evil in the Lord's sight, so he put him to death also. So then, that leaves one other son. Look what happens with this other son. Verse 11, then Judah said to his daughter-in-law, Tamar, Hey, remain a widow in your father's house until my son Shelah grows up. For he thought he might die too like his brother's. So it sounds like hey, Judah is just going to wait till Shayla gets a little bit older and then he'll send him to, to Tamar like he's supposed to. But then we read that last line and he doesn't really have any intention to do that. After seeing his other two sons die with this woman, God judging them for their sin, Judah's afraid that the same thing is going to happen to his other son and he's not going gonna to be left with no sons. And so he has no intention to be faithful And what he's called to do here. He's willing to disobey God and God's law in order to preserve himself and his son's life. And the key point here is that, first of all, disobedience to doing what is right and what God says is right is never justified. We could say, well, Judah just wanted to help his son. That's disobedience to God. And that's never justified. So Tamar, verse 11, went to live in her father's house. So throughout the the whole part, first part of this story, we are just reminded sin has serious consequences. Sin affected this family. Just think of all the brokenness that we see here. All the hurt and people left in in the wake of all the sin that's been going on. For Ur and Onan, pretty immediate consequences. They lost their life. As a result, Judah, their father, is grieving Wondering what is happening to my family. Tamar is hurt and been mistreated by men. And she's left without uh, someone to provide for her. Listen, if you think you can sin and get away with it. And this calls us to reconsider that thought. All sin is serious. It has consequences in our lives and in the lives of those around us. And ultimately it has consequences with God. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. Right, We see that from the very beginning of the book of the Bible. When, when the consequence of sin is death, spiritual death, and ultimately physical death. So let me just ask you, what sin is in your life? What thought? What word? What action? Take it seriously now. No matter how small or how insignificant it may seem. This calls us to take it seriously. Which then leads to the second point. Sin discourages and leads to desperation. Shelo, his youngest son, grows up, and, and Judah refused to give Tamar to him as a wife to continue the line. And so Judah is still continuing on in sin 
out of fear of losing his son. And so Tamar finds herself in a desperate place. She's discouraged. She's hurting. She's desperate. No family, no heir to take care of her. No man to provide for her because women in that day didn't work. They couldn't really provide for themselves. And so she decides to take matters into her own hands out of desperation. Now, just a side note. We aren't really given any divine commentary from God here in this passage about uh, Tamar's actions and whether they are right or wrong. But let me just say, if anybody is commendable in this whole story, it's Tamar. Because she is acting boldly, trying to right the wrong that's been done to her. And so she takes off her widow's clothes, she puts on a veil, and goes to Judah and makes herself available. Verse 15, when Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. He went over to her and said, come, let me sleep with you, for he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, what will you give me for sleeping with me? And so what does he do? He promises to send a goat to, to pay her for, for, this, uh, for doing this, and then she asks her personal items while she's waiting on the goat to kind of hold him captive to his promise, right? And she asked for a signet ring, cord, and a staff. And so in verses 18 through 19, we see that Judah sleeps with her. She becomes pregnant. She then leaves and goes back and, re- and puts on her, her uh, widow's clothes again. And later on, Judah, trying to keep his promise, sends the goat with his servant uh, to look for th- this woman. And the servant asks, where is that cult prostitute? Uh, who, and, and, and tries to give her the goat, but no one knew who he is talking about. And so at this point, Judah just goes on with his life, thinking everything's fine. I'm going to get away with this. Nobody's going to know. It's not a big deal. But everything is not fine. Everything may look fine, but it's not. Judah is living in complete wickedness here. Right? He's engaging in intimate relationships with a woman who he he thought was a prostitute in a temple for false gods, which is basically idolatry and an affront to God. And sin has led to all this hurt. And Tamar's left hurting, desperate, with no choice but to deceive her own father-in-law to get pregnant by him. Do you see the, the shame that's all over this family? The discouragement? The desperation? That sin can lead to? It didn't start start off this way, but it got there. Listen, when sin goes unchecked, unaddressed in our own hearts, it will grow bigger and bigger and wreak more and more havoc in the lives of the people around us, the people we love, and in our own lives. This is a warning to us. First of all, it's a warning about who we marry, Right? Because who did Judah marry? Somebody who was far from God, who didn't worship his God. And God, we know, gives warnings throughout the Bible about being equally yoked and marrying people who worship him, even to the nation of Israel. And so it's essential, if if you're not yet married, if you marry, that you marry a spouse, you choose a spouse who shares your faith. And I'm not just talking about somebody who goes along with your faith, who may attend church with you, who doesn't mind that you love Jesus. I mean somebody who whose heart beats for Christ like yours. I mean, loves Jesus, wants to serve him with all they are. If not, you might find yourself in a situation like Judah. But another warning, we live in a culture where sin and even sexual sin, like pornography and things like that, is treated very lightly, even accepted. And any time a a Christian lives in a culture, we are in danger of being sucked into the the values of that culture. And the temptation we all face is to minimize it. Everybody's doing it. It's okay. It's not that bad if everybody's doing it. It's culturally accepted. We're going to be accepted by the people around us. We're going to be able to talk to the, the buddies at work. And we feel like we need it. And the Bible says, no, every little sin, every big sin, every sin matters. And it is serious, and it will lead us into desperation if we don't take it seriously. And so we have to fight the narrative of the culture and our sinful desires within us. We have to submit every thought, every action, every word we speak to Christ. And what God says in his word pleases him. 
So think about the way you've been talking to the people around you. God says, submit those words to him. And ask yourself, do those words please God? Think about the ways you spent your week, the evenings, the days this past week. God says, think about those moments. Did those things please me? Right? We have to learn how to take all those things captive to obey Christ. Because every sin matters to God. And it matters to our spiritual life. It matters to our joy in Christ. Submit those things to him. So Tamar has been desperate. Judah has sinned big because they haven't submitted their lives to Christ, to, to God. Does God leave them, though? No, he doesn't. This is the faithfulness of our God. He does not leave them in this, this place. But he does work to reveal what has really happened. Sin exposes faithlessness. Three months later, in the story, Judah finds out that his daughter-in-law is pregnant. And so what does he do? He asks her to be brought out and burned to death. You talk about hypocrisy. Verse 25, as she was being brought out, she sent her father-in-law this message. I am pregnant by the, man, by the man to whom these items belong. And she added, examine them. Whose signet ring, cord, and staff are these? Judas caught. And we see this important truth. Your sins will eventually find you out. You may think that no one sees, but God sees. And God loves us enough to not allow those things to go unseen. He wants us to come face to face with who we really are. Not who we pretend to be, not who we want to be, but who we really are. And know that eventually we will sow what we reap. Judah had a choice. He could have tried to cover it up at this point, couldn't he have? He could have tried to make excuses. But instead, we see God at work. Verse 26, Judah recognized them and said, She is more in the right than I. She's right, I'm not. Since I did not give her to my son, Shelah. I didn't do what I was supposed to do. She's right, I was wrong. And he did not know her intimately again. Ultimately, God's design here in exposing this sin was to help him see his sin. And to see that what he did came from a lack of faith. Because he was trusting in his own ideas, his own way, and not in what God called him to do. And that realization is meant to lead him to repentance. Why did all this happen? Because Judah didn't trust God's plan. He trusted in his own wisdom. Judah lacked faith. And God was using all this, all the havoc it caused, to, to show him, hey, you don't really have faith in me. And what did Judah do? He responded with repentance. He owned his sin, and he was not intimate with her again. He changed his ways. Now listen, you and I, in this world, we'll find ourselves in times where we sin. Some of you sinned on the car ride over here today. I know I've been there. I know how that goes. And it's not to excuse sin for one second. Listen, if we are followers of Jesus, his spirit enables us to say no to sin. So we can't excuse it. He has given us his spirit to empower us to live for him. But in this world, we will still struggle with sin. And the question is, what are you going to do when your sin is exposed? And that's, here's what this story teaches us. What matters to God is not where you start, but where are you going? Not just do you sin, but will you change when you know you sin? Will your eyes be open? Like Judah's eyes were opened there in that moment. When is the last time you've said to someone before God, I was wrong? When is the last time you said to someone you love, I was wrong and you were right? And you changed your ways. Judah had his eyes opened. 
And in that moment, he noticed, I have been way off track with my life. It's a mess. My faith has been in myself and not in God. And when God does that, we, he wants us to know this is the work of his spirit. Exposing, throwing a spotlight on our sin in ways that we didn't. So that we are broken and we are moved to trust him and he opens our blind eyes. This is his grace to Judah. And this is the same grace that he has done for you and I when we realize we have sin too. And he's proven that he is worth trusting. Right? He has sent his son. Jesus reveals that he has the answer for our sin. We can trust him with it. That Jesus on the cross really can forgive that he has grace in our sin, that he has power to give new life and put us in a new direction. He can give us new hearts. And when God exposes your sin, the only right response is to repent and run to Jesus in his way. No excuses, no justifying. Own it. And in brokenness, put all your faith in God, not in yourself. God exposes our lack of faith, which then leads to the last truth, which then it reinforces that God is worthy of our faith. Sin can never keep God from accomplishing his plan. First, we have to be clear. What, what is God's plan? What is God's plan? And it's this. To save and to redeem sinners by his grace to his glory. When you think about the world, what God is doing in the world, his plan is to save and redeem sinful people for his glory. And so what does this mean? That our sin, no matter how big or small it may be, can never keep God from breaking into our lives. We can't stop his plan. And if his plan is to break into our lives and to redeem our broken mess, he will do it. We can't keep him from doing that. Which means we don't give up on God when we are stuck in sin, and we don't give up on others who are stuck in sin. Verse 27 through 30, we see that Tamar is pregnant with twins. One puts his hand out first, and they tie a thread around it, but then the other baby comes out first, and the firstborn is named Perez. And the one who had the scarlet thread tied to his hand is called Zerah. Now Perez, surprisingly, this is all in God's providence, that he is born first, becomes the prominent firstborn son. But as we keep reading our Bibles, I love this. This, is, this just shows us God's bigger plan. In the, the course of the Bible, we get to the book of Ruth, a few books later on, and we see that King David and the other kings of Israel end up descending from this man Perez. Highlighting, this just highlights God's grace to Judah and Tamar. In all this mess of Genesis 38, King David's going to come from this. The kings of Israel are going to come from this. Judah had no clue in this story that his family would produce kings. All he knew was he was a sinful man and he needed God's grace. That's all he knew. But the Lord, by his grace, met him and transformed him in that moment when he saw his need. And we can see the beginning of Judah as a new creation when he admits his guilt and he humbles himself before Tamar and the Canaanites, before God. But there's more than just King David, right? Not only did kings descend from Judah and Perez, the king of kings, Jesus Christ, came from this man. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 3, Tamar and Perez both appear in the genealogy of Jesus. Tamar becomes one of the only women listed in that genealogy. The Canaanite woman who was not born a follower of God. What we see is that God is able to turn evil things to his own purposes and bring blessing from curses. To redeem what deserves destruction and bring it into the realm of his blessing and grace. And when God sent his son into the world to save sinners like you and me, he didn't isolate Jesus from sinful humanity that he came to redeem. He came from them. And what we can say about this family is, what a messy past, but what a glorious future because of Jesus. And that's what Jesus offers you and I. You and I have a messy past. 
And some of us are in that mess right now. Sin has wreaked havoc in your life and in the people in your life. But if you know this, if you are in Christ, if you have given your life to Jesus, and he invites you to do that today, if you haven't already, God invites you to that. That offer is for every sinful person who has ever lived, every person who has ever lived. If you are in Christ, truly in him, and you are seeking to walk with him by faith, living your life according to what he says and not your own desires, you may have a messy past, but you have been promised a glorious future because of Jesus. Because no sin can ever keep God from accomplishing his plan. At this point in Genesis, we just take a step back and we think, Joseph's in prison. Jacob, his father, doesn't know what to do. Judah's over here making a mess out of his own family. And we just look at it and say, this is God's chosen people? Why would God choose these people? What is going on here? This is a family in need of God's grace. And what do we see? God is a God who is able to redeem it all. He's able to redeem all the shame, all the guilt, all the sin, and bring good to the lives of the mess we make. And in the big, grand story of the Bible, this, this is bigger than just Judah and Jacob and Joseph and their families. This is Jesus' family. The Savior of sinners who came as a sinless man, perfect sacrifice to satisfy God's justice at the cross, who humbled himself, came from a long line of sinful people. Yet unlike David and Judah and you and I, Jesus didn't fall prey to temptation and sin. He lived perfectly. He perf perfectly fulfilled God's demands and his law so that he could deliver us from it. He took our place at the cross. Who would have thought that Judah's shame would eventually lead to salvation for peoples all across the world? That's how big God is. Jesus' family, full of sinners, has room for you in his family. Sinner as you may be. Know this, Jesus in his great mercy can redeem your sin. He can bring good to your life when you trust him by faith, when you walk with him by faith, when you give yourself to him, all of yourself to him. Let's pray together. Father, we just thank you that you are a God who can take a story, a real thing that happened in this world, like Judah and Tamar, and accomplish a glorious good in their lives and ultimately in the lives of all humanity. This offer of your grace and mercy that came from one of the most desperate situations possible. And Lord, we're reminded that no, no matter how desperate we may feel or be, that it is not beyond you. And all you ask us to do is to trust you. To trust you in a way that it changes our lives, changes what we live for, changes who we are. We pray that we would do that, that you would put that on our hearts and move us to that today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to stand as we sing and respond uh, to God's word and song. If you want to talk about the sermon or anything that God's put on your heart, if you want to talk about what it means to follow Jesus and trust in his way you can uh, come and see me uh, after the service is over I would love to talk with you and uh, let's continue worshiping in song together
may be seated. And at this time, we're going to continue worshiping as we observe the Lord's Supper uh, together. The Lord's Supper is an ordinance that uh, Jesus himself gave to the church to consider him, to be mindful of his physical body and the blood that he shed for us and how he took our punishment on his own body for, for our sake, for our salvation. As we prepare to take the Lord's Supper, we want, we want to be mindful of the symbolism, that the, the bread represents the body of Christ, that he laid down for us, bearing our sin and our punishment in his own body. The blood represents the, the blood that was shed to purchase our forgiveness. And the Bible tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. The wages of death is or wages of sin is death. And Christ has paid the wages of all who have put their faith in him. And he sealed it with his blood. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-six 26, that we are proclaiming his death to one another as we take this supper together. We're proclaiming the good news of what Jesus has done, the price he had paid, but the good news that he has purchased with it. This is good news for you and I, that we no longer stand before God guilty, if our faith is in Jesus, we stand forgiven because of what Christ has done. This is good news. Verse uh, 27 through 28 of 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says that we should examine ourselves. When, whenever eating the, bre the bread or drinking the cup of the Lord, we should examine ourselves. So first, today as we prepare our hearts for this supper, this meal around the death of our Lord, examine, first of all, to see, are you in the faith? The Lord's Supper is reserved for those who are trusting in Christ and this good news for salvation. The Bible actually says those who take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner are condemning themselves. And so we want to be serious. Are we trusting in Christ for his forgiveness and salvation? Are we living for him in repentance and faith? Trusting him. Not perfectly. None of us are perfect. But we're walking with Jesus by faith and what he has done, and who he is, and his life. The Lord's Supper is a time to examine our hearts. Is there any sin that is remaining in you? To be obedient to Christ. To give those things to him. To confess them, and turn from them, and turn to his way. So we want to invite all here who have put their faith in Jesus Christ, who have been scripturally baptized, immersed as a believer, to, to uh, join us. If you haven't been baptized, I would call you to consider what is keeping you from obedience to Christ in that way? We have some baptisms coming up in a few weeks. And uh, you, we all need to consider, this is a command of Christ. Have I been baptized as a believer in Jesus in response to my faith? So if you've been baptized, if you're a follower of Jesus, walking with him in repentance of faith, we would invite you to join with us in this time. Uh, let's take a moment and pray and come before the Lord privately. And then we'll take this together as a symbol of the unity of us being the body of Christ, that he is brought together by faith in him. Let's pray together. Father, you are worthy of all praise and glory. You have sent your Son, who has borne our punishment on his own body on the tree, who has shed his blood to purchase our forgiveness when we had no way. So great is your love and your mercy toward us. Our hearts overflow in praise that you would consider us. And now we come before you laying our lives before your throne saying, Lord, have your way. And we worship you. We pro proclaim to one another the good news of what you have done. Be glorified in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. So at the supper, Jesus uh, took the bread 
and he gave thanks, and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. God's word tells us that before, after they took the Lord's Supper and before they dispersed from that room, that they sang a hymn. So will you please rise and let's join our hearts in the singing of the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Have a great rest of your day, folks, and we will see you next time. God be with you.